This presentation is part of an educational program that's sponsored by the United States Environmental Protection Agency, and it's intended to educate residents of apartment communities about bed bugs, how to recognize them, and what to do if you have a problem. So I, I thought I'd start off with a little bit of trivia. Uh, there's not a person in the world that hasn't heard the nighttime rhyme, the good night, sleep tight, don't let the bed bugs bite. Everybody's heard the rhyme. But does anybody know where it came from? It appears to have originated sometime in the 1800s. And back in the 1800s, we didn't have box springs. Mattresses would rest on ropes on the bed frame. And so the ropes would be tightened with wooden dowels along the side of the bed frame. And the tighter you made the ropes, the firmer the sleep, the better night sleep you would get. So that's where sleep tight comes from. And then bed bugs in the 1800s were really, really common. So you know how the rest goes, right? So sleep tight and don't let the bed bugs bite. We virtually eradicated bed bugs in this country shortly after World War II through wide scale use of chemicals like DDT. And we were really essentially free of bed bug activity other than maybe a, a few infestations here or there. But we really didn't have a problem with bed bugs for nearly 40 years or more. That is until about 1999 when bed bugs started being introduced back into the country in a more frequent basis. And at that time, it was primarily limited to the hospitality industry, uh, mostly hotels and motels. And most people would have thought, oh, well, it's probably the, the, the lower class motels that had a problem. But that wasn't the case at all. It was the middle and the upper class hotels that were being affected. It was mostly associated with executive business travel and it was associated with leisure travel. So people that were traveling to other parts of the world where bed bugs were still very prevalent and bringing them back into the country. And because we no longer had effective chemicals like DDT, the bed bugs were able to get a foothold in our country once again. So the problem started somewhere in the late 1990s and then it quickly spread from the hospitality industry into the residential sector. The multifamily housing industry, the apartment industry, was one of the most badly affected when this occurred. But it wasn't just apartments. Bed bugs are very common in university housing, as well as single family residences in middle and upper class neighborhoods as well. Recognizing that bed bugs were once again becoming prevalent in our society, the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development began to report calls that were coming into their agency. So prior to 2003, they didn't even track bed bugs. But you can see in 2004, 537 calls came in to the New York City HPD. And that increased to nearly 13,000 calls by 2010. That is incredible growth. There are very few things that can spread at this kind of rate. This is exponential in nature. But it's not just cities like New York. We have bed bugs affecting cities throughout the country, small little rural towns in states that aren't densely populated like Wyoming and West Virginia. This is not just a big city problem. It affects places in all 50 states. So this is a national issue that we're dealing with. Because bed bugs are such great hitchhikers, they are then transported from infested residences out into our communities. And so you can see from this list here on the slide that maybe instead of asking the question, where do we find bed bugs, the better question might be, where don't we find them? Because bed bugs are showing up virtually everywhere in our society. They're kind of infesting the fabric of our society like they did before World War II. So because bed bugs are so prevalent in our country, it's really critical that everybody become educated about them. And that's what today is about. It's about bringing everyone together and all the housing communities to try and educate you about bed bugs so that you know that they exist, how to recognize the signs and symptoms, what to do if you suspect a problem in your apartment. Because without good education and without everybody's being involved, it's going to be very difficult to get community-wide management of bed bugs. Okay, so I'd like to start by clearing up some common misconceptions. First, a lot of people think that bed bugs are invisible, and they're not. All bed bugs can be seen by the naked eye. All stages can be seen by the naked eye. Some of the stages, like the younger immature bed bugs and the eggs, are quite small, and they can be difficult to see, but if you have good eyesight, you can still see them. They don't jump or fly. Bed bugs don't have wings. These insects rely on crawling to move around. They also do not infest people. People don't get infested. 
dwellings get infested and the contents of the dwellings get infested. They're not caused by poor sanitation. So it doesn't matter how neat or how unclean a dwelling is. That in itself does not prevent or cause a problem. But if bed bugs are introduced into an apartment and there's a lot of clutter, that can really complicate control efforts. I think one of the most important things is that there's absolutely no reason for people to be embarrassed or ashamed to report a problem. A lot of people just don't want anyone to know they have bed bugs. But the simple matter is that any one of us can get bed bugs. Nobody brings bed bugs into their homes intentionally. We usually get them without even knowing it. So, and this is a problem that can affect anybody, any one of us. So you want to make sure that you report problems immediately. So I want to start off with some basic facts. We've dispelled some common misconceptions. Now let's look at some facts about biology and behavior. What you're looking at are first stage newly hatched immature bed bugs. Their skin is clear, so you can see right through them and you can see that they've recently fed on blood. They're full of a blood meal. And so they're crimson red. So bed bugs feed exclusively on blood and nothing but blood. They get all of their water and all of their nutrients from the blood that they feed on. They require it as immatures to develop from one stage to the next, to the next, to the next until they reach adulthood. And when they're adults, they require it for reproduction. So they're always feeding on blood. But they're not feeding on blood every single day. Bed bugs, an individual bed bug, may not take a blood meal for a week or more. Uh, so this is important because 90% of a bed bug's life is spent hiding in secrecy, where they're hard to find and hard to treat, making it very difficult to control them. And then they only come out about 10% of their time to feed or mate or, or do something that's required for development or reproduction. So this is a real challenge for control because when we come in to treat an apartment, there's only a small fraction of that population that's actually gonna be active in the, the days to come. And by the time a lot of these bugs encounter the chemicals, they're not working as well or they may not be working at all. So it can be difficult to control them. They're also very resilient. They can survive a long time without feeding. So you're not going to starve them out. People think, well, maybe if they leave and they vacate, the bugs will die. But the bugs can survive several months or more without a blood meal. So vacating is not really a solution. They're also very prolific. The female, when she reaches adulthood, she's going to deposit between one and as many as three eggs every single day of her life. And she's going to deposit these eggs in places that are hard to find. In addition, the eggs are very resilient. They're hard to destroy. There's not a lot of chemicals that kill the eggs, and there's only a few methods that work effectively. So another challenging stage. It also takes seven to 10 days for these eggs to hatch. So as females are laying eggs throughout the environment, any eggs that are missed during control are going to hatch in the next week or so and set the stage for rebound. So this is part of the reason the feeding once a week and the, the slow hatch of the eggs is why we have to have repeated service calls. And lastly, they're nocturnal and they're very secretive. So they're hard to find and they're hard to treat. So in the last slide, you saw what the first stage immature looked like when it's fully engorged. But not all bed bugs look like that. They vary in size and they vary in color and they can be flat or they can be swollen, depending upon their developmental stage and whether or not they fed. So here we have an egg, and the egg looks like a little grain of rice. It's pearly white, and it's about a millimeter, which is about the size of, the, of a pinhead. So they're very small, and they're hard to see. Now from that egg, we're going to get a first stage immature bed bug. And you can see that that first stage bed bug doesn't look a lot like the adult. It looks very different. It's very, very tiny and it's pale, or almost straw-colored, tan. And here's an example of how small they are. This is a penny, and you can see the letters in God we trust. These are two immature bed bugs. They're about the size of a letter on a penny. You can see them, but they're hard to find. Now, they're going to develop into a second stage, a third, a fourth, and a fifth. They're going to require a blood meal between each stage. They're going to shed their skin and go to the next stage. Each time they shed their skin, they're going to get a little bigger, and they're also going to get a little darker in color and resemble the adult. Finally, they're going to molt into or shed their skin a last time and become an adult. And now they're much bigger. They're about a quarter inch, which is about the size of an apple seed. And they are reddish brown in color, a lot easier to see at that point. Here you can see what an adult bed bug looks like when it's been blood fed and it's swollen. Okay, as I mentioned, they feed on blood. And this feeding typically occurs at night. So usually bed bugs are feeding at night while people are fast asleep. And the bite is typically painless, so the person doesn't usually know that they're being bitten. 
And once the bugs are done feeding, they're going to scurry back to their secretive hiding places where they're going to remain undetected. Although they feed mostly at night, they will feed at any time of the day or night, depending upon when the blood meal is present. So if somebody was working night shifts all the time and they were only home during the day, the bug would shift its feeding to the daytime when the food was available. Or if there's a very severe population and there's a lot of competition for food, the bugs are going to feed when they can get their blood meal. It takes about three to ten minutes for that bug to fill up with blood. And during that time, it might switch its feeding sites on the same person. So they might feed in one spot, then move and insert their mouth parts into another and another and another. And if you develop welts, you could have five or six welts from a single bed bug. So you can't equate the number of welts with the number of bugs that caused those bite symptoms. And then finally, when they consume that red blood, that blood is going to be digested and it's going to be excreted. And when that happens, it's no longer red. It's going to be a black, dark, liquid droplet. Now, why is that important? It's important because a lot of people, when you tell them to look for blood stains, they're looking for blo red blood stains on their sheets. And that's not typically what you're going to find with bed bugs. The only way you're going to get red blood stains is if a bed bug is filling up with blood and you squash it while it still has the crimson red blood in it. But when this blood's being digested, it's going to excrete what we call spotting. And spotting is the dark excreted blood droplets that is left on wood and sheets and mattresses and things of that nature. So this is one of the major signs that we're looking for as an indicator of activity. Okay, now again, because they feed on blood, a lot of people get very concerned about disease transmission. Do these insects transmit diseases from one person to the next because of the blood feeding, like mosquitoes do? Well, the good news is that they don't. Bed bugs have never been demonstrated to be able to transmit diseases through their blood feeding activity. However, they do feed on people, and because they're feeding on people, you can develop bite symptoms. And they can also be emotionally upsetting to a lot of people. And so for these two reasons, even though they're not considered a disease transmitter, they are still considered a pest of public health importance. Now, a lot of people, when they get bitten, their reactions vary quite a bit. Some people have delayed reactions. In fact, most people need to become sensitized to the bites. In other words, they need to be bitten several times before they're going to start reacting. So they may have delayed symptoms of several days to a week or more before any kind of symptoms start to develop. Then there are other people who never develop any symptoms at all. And that's the most common among the elderly. For some reason, and we don't know exactly why, the elderly very often do not react to bed bug bites. So on one hand, you could say this is great because you're not suffering from all the itchy welts. On the other hand, it's not so great because if you're not seeing the bugs and you're not developing bite symptoms, you don't know you have a problem. And now the bed bug infestation can get worse and worse and worse until you figure it out. Now when people do react, they report feeling itchy, having swelling, sometimes pustules or blisters. If there's a lot of scratching, it can result in scarring. And as I mentioned, people will, can also be affected emotionally. It can cause loss of sleep nightmares, and some people will report having stress or anxiety in their lives as a result of the problem. Okay, now obviously bed bugs are really good at getting around. They've gone from being virtually non-existent to being all throughout our country in huge numbers in just less than 10 years. So how do they do this? Well, there's two ways that bed bugs disperse throughout structures. One is passive dispersal, the other is active dispersal. Passive dispersal is really common in apartment buildings. And this is when bed bugs are transported from an infested dwelling to an uninfested environment on personal belongings or objects. So in other words, let's say um, a child who lives in an infested building goes to school. They might take bed bugs from home into the school on their backpack. Or a parent might take bed bugs from home to work on their computer bag or their purse or tote bag. You might inadvertently transfer bed bugs during social visits between infested apartments and uninfested apartments or through care visits, homemakers and things of that nature. So there's lots of ways that bed bugs can be moved on contents, occasionally even on clothing, but that's not nearly as common. In addition to this kind of passive dispersal, there's also active dispersal. Active dispersal is when the bug is physically crawling from one location to another. And this is also common in apartment buildings, where bed bugs might move between walls, floors, ceilings from infested apartments to neighboring units. They can even go right out the door down the hallway into a neighboring unit. 
So obviously this kind of dispersal is going to happen more often when you have severe infestations. So the, the worse the infestation, the more likely it's going to affect neighboring units. So for this reason, you can see that early detection is absolutely critical. Uh, we don't want bed bug infestations to become so severe that they become very expensive to control, very difficult to control, and start spreading to neighboring apartments. Because when we identify infestations early on, when let's say we identify bed bugs within the first few weeks of introduction, the populations are very small, they tend to be very localized, and they can be controlled pretty easily and inexpensively, and spread is not really likely. So that's why we want to make sure that everybody's familiar with how to recognize the signs and symptoms of bed bugs. So you want to remember that bed bugs come in different sizes and different shapes, from very small and tan to large and red and brown. They can be red blood filled as immatures or they can be dark brown blood filled as adults. They can be flat or swollen. So many times you may actually see the live bugs themselves and, and you want to know all the different stages. You also want to be familiar with the other signs so you can recognize them. The spotting, the eggs, the shed skin. So here we see everything. We see live bugs, we see shed skins from different developmental stages, we see black spotting, and we see eggs. These are all the different things that you want to be paying attention to. So where do you look for bed bugs? Well, that seems obvious. You look on your bed, right? But a lot of people would think that you're going to find bed bugs on your mattress. And that's not where you're necessarily going to find them when the infestations are really small. Because when bed bugs are introduced, remember this is a cryptic secretive insect. They specialize in not being found. And so when infestations are very small at the very beginning, they're much more likely to be on your box spring than they are to be on the mattress. So you want to pay attention to the corners of the box spring, especially the lower corners behind those little plastic guards around the corners of the bed or un just underneath the box spring. And then as the infestation starts to get larger and more populated, the likelihood that you're going to find them on the mattress goes up. So if you're finding bed bugs on your mattress, it's possible that it's actually been there for longer than you think. But here you see again, we see black spotting, we see live bugs, bugs and shed skins along the piping and the seams and the tufts of the mattress. Upholstered furniture. Uh, sofas, couches, armchairs, recliners are just as likely to be infested as the bed is. So I know that a lot of people think bed bugs live in beds and that's all, but no, they live in places where people sleep or rest and a lot of other places too. So you spend a lot of time at rest on upholstered furniture and therefore they're very likely to be here. So you want to inspect upholstered furniture as well. Underneath the arms, down along the piping, if there's a skirt at the bottom of the furniture, you want to lift that skirt up and there might be underneath there as well. But they're not limited to sleeping and resting areas. They don't just infest beds and upholstered furniture. They also infest the contents of structures. So they'll get into virtually anything within the apartment. And the closer these items are to the sleeping or resting area, the more likely they are to become infested because that's where the majority of the bugs are. So here we have shoes that were stored next to a bed or close to a bed, and you can see that the shoes are infested. This is a nightstand that was next to a bed, and you can see all the signs of the bed bugs, the eggs, the fecal material, the live bugs, and that's because, again, it's so close to the bed. Now, as populations get bigger and bigger, the kinds of places that they're going to infest are going to become less and less predictable. So now, as populations are severe, they're not just going to be in the beds and the items close to the beds, but they're going to start infesting things further away from the beds and all kinds of things, like inside the bindings of books or on stuffed animals. Or This is an adjustable wrench with a whole population inside the head of an adjustable wrench, somewhere you would never think that bed bugs would be. So this is what happens as these infestations become severe. Okay, now imagine if you add clutter to the mix, right? And now if we have all this clutter in our bedroom, well, this can really complicate things. I think you can see that, that bed bugs could be in anything here. And we can't just treat all these personal belongings with pesticides. So this is really going to make it very difficult to get bed bugs out of this apartment now. So we want to find these infestations before this happens. And we want to get rid of this clutter before we get an infestation, because you can see this is going to make it difficult and expensive. So how do we control bed bugs? Well, let's first start by talking about how do you prevent introducing them. There's no absolute way to prevent introducing bed bugs into your apartment, but there are certainly things that you can do to reduce the likelihood of introducing them into your homes. 
So one thing is that you want to avoid picking up used or discarded furniture. These days, if there's something sitting by, like a sofa or furniture sitting by the dumpster or the curbside, there's a really good chance it was put there because it had bed bugs. And the last thing you want to do is bring that into your home. Likewise, if you shop in, in secondhand stores, like thrift shops, and I know a lot of us do, um, you have to realize, I'm not saying not to shop in these types of stores, but you do have to recognize that because bed bugs can survive many months without feeding, that items that are infested can come into these shops and the bugs can just sit on them and then you can bring them into your home. So you are at an increased risk for bringing bed bugs into your home with secondhand items than if you were to buy brand new items. Now, I know that a lot of us shop there, and I know that you're not necessarily going to stop shopping there, but you want to know that you probably want to avoid buying like beds or upholstered furniture in secondhand stores, or if you are going to be buying things, you definitely want to at least inspect them thoroughly before bringing them into your home, and be very vigilant in looking for bed bugs after you've brought them into your home. We're also going to talk about some of the things that you can do to protect yourself against items that you buy in just a few minutes. Okay, certainly you want to frequently launder your linens. Uh, it's recommended that you launder your linens once a week. And when you're laundering your linens, you're going to be stripping the bed, and this is a, a great time to do an inspection, looking for the signs and symptoms that we've already talked about. And again, paying attention to the box spring and the mattress. This is also a good time to include a quick look at your upholstered furniture. If you're in a position that you can afford to purchase bed bug encasements, it's a great idea to do so. This is something that's great to do before you get an infestation. The reason why, you know, some people say, well, why would I encase my beds before I get bed bugs? Well, if you have bed bug encasements on your beds, then if you accidentally or inadvertently get bugs into your apartment, they're not going to be able to get inside of the box spring, inside of the mattress where they're hard to see and difficult to deal with. Instead, they're going to be restricted to the outside on the smooth white surface where you can easily see them and they can be easily dealt with but you want to make sure that you're purchasing encasements that were specifically designed for use with bed bugs. Removing clutter, I can't say enough about this. Clutter is probably the biggest obstacle we face in bed bug management, so it's best to eliminate clutter before you get bed bugs. Not saying that many people would live like this, but you can barely see this person's bed. So maybe you don't have that kind of clutter, but you might have a pile of clothing next to the bed or next to the sofa, and those types of things are going to be likely to get infested. So it's a good time to do some spring cleaning and look through what you have. If you no longer want it or you no longer need it, then get rid of it. But if it's something that is important to you and you want to keep it, then inspect it and then you can keep it stored in a, a sealed storage bin and keep it away from the sleeping and resting areas. You just want to make sure that these bins, the lids are kept closed. And the other thing is never store anything under or on a bed or a sofa. So you wouldn't want to have items underneath the bed because this will surely get infested and be a problem. If at any time you suspect a problem with bed bugs, let's say you see something that you think are bed bugs or you start developing some sort of symptoms on your body that you believe might be bite symptoms, don't wait. Immediately report this to management, even if you're not 100% sure, because it's much better to have somebody come out and try and verify whether or not you have a problem than you waiting to see if you really do and having the problem get out of control. And if you see any live insects, you might want to try and save a sample, put it in a container or something, so that somebody who's properly qualified can look at it and verify if it is or is not a bed bug. Okay, so let's say you do get a bed bug infestation. Bed bugs do get into your apartment. Well, one of the first questions is, what do I do with my bed? The knee-jerk reaction that a lot of people have is they immediately either discard their bed, they throw it away, or they start dousing it with pesticides. Neither one of these methods is recommended, and neither one of these is necessary, obviously. So what do you do with beds? Well, again, we can turn to encasements. Before, I talked about encasements as a preventive measure, as an early detection measure. But if your beds were not encased and you did get bed bugs, you can salvage bedding by putting encasements on the beds. So what would happen is the beds would be encased and this would trap any live bugs inside the encasement. And because the encasements are bite proof, escape proof, and entry proof, if you're getting the right ones, then the bugs will become trapped, starve, and die. And no new bugs can get in. Okay, now there's some people that say, I don't care. You know what, if my bed gets infested, I'm throwing it away because I can't deal with that. And that's fine, 
but it's not necessary. So you may want to discard a bed, a piece of upholstered furniture, or some other infested item. You need to know that you do not need to discard these items. We can address them in various ways. But if that's what you want to do, it's okay. Just don't do it yourself. Call management first and have them come out and help you properly discard it. Because furniture that is discarded by residents is typically not discarded properly. And when it's not discarded properly, it's being dragged out of the apartment, down the hall, down the elevator, out through the lobby, onto the curb. Now we've got bed bugs scattered everywhere, and we've got an infested piece of furniture sitting on the curb that some unsuspecting person is going to come and pick up and take into their home or bring right back into the building. So we don't want that, right? So call management, and they will come up, and they will help you discard this in a proper manner. Okay, interceptor devices, these are plastic dishes that get placed underneath the legs of beds and upholstered furniture and, and other items. And they intercept bed bugs as they're traveling for a blood meal. So what the bugs do, if you notice on this bed, the sheets are tucked in so they're not touching the floor. That means that the bugs have to go past this little plastic dish to get up a leg and onto the bed. In doing so, they climb this outside wall and they fall into this well on the outside of the interceptor and they get trapped in there. So this is a great way for us to detect bed bugs. It's a good way for us to evaluate the success of our treatment efforts. And it's also great because every bug that's trapped in that interceptor device is a bug that's not feeding on you. You can also hot launder. One of the most effective things that you can do to help yourself and to help the bed bug eradication effort. You don't have to put it in the washer. If you are going to put it in the washer, you want to put it on a hot wash cycle. But you can put it right in the dryer on a hot dry cycle as well. And there's lots of things that can be laundered, like stuffed animals and clothing and linens. So hot laundering is a great way to help yourself and help the control effort. Well, obviously not everything can be hot laundered. You, you can't necessarily launder your shoes or a picture frame. There's a lot of things that you can't put in a washer or dryer. These items can either be heated in portable heat chambers. Now this can get a little expensive to buy one of these heat chambers like you see here on the left. These you plug into the wall, you put the infested items in it, and it bakes them. Like I said, this can be a little bit more expensive. But if you want to buy one, they're a great tool. You never want to put anything in the oven, okay? Don't try and bake infested items in the oven. You'll cause a fire, so don't even think about that. Okay, but you don't have to buy a heat chamber necessarily. You can do free bed bug control by placing small items into plastic bags and putting them into a household freezer as well and freezing them for four days. And this will also destroy eggs. One of the biggest mistakes that, that residents make is applying chemicals on their own. It's very easy to go down to the local store and purchase pesticides and apply these chemicals on your own. And I know that a lot of people really feel compelled to do this because they feel that they have to do something. But what I can tell you is not only does it get very expensive to buy all these products, but a lot of these products don't work very well and some of them don't work at all. Bed bugs are highly resistant to many of the chemicals and most of the pesticides that you can buy are not very effective. And then people aren't trained in how to use them correctly and so they start spraying them all over their mattresses and their furniture. It's just not a good idea and you're not really gonna get the results. So I would really strongly urge you not to apply pesticides on your own, and especially bug bombs. Bug bombs don't work on bed bugs, and they can make the problems worse. So you, you want to avoid the use of bug bombs. They can also uh, create fire hazards and explosion hazards if they're not used correctly. So to avoid these types of problems, you really want to leave applications to licensed applicators. Leave it to the professionals who are properly trained in which materials work and how and where to use them effectively and safely. If you absolutely are going to apply chemicals on your own, and I strongly urge you not to, then what I would suggest is that you look for something like diatomaceous earth. Diatomaceous earth is a powder. It's essentially non-toxic. It's a physical kill. It dehydrates the bed bugs. And you can get it in these bottles that you can puff it out. And what you don't want to do is what this person did. You can see this is excessive application. You don't need piles of dust. This is not the way it should be applied. It should be lightly dusted out into the cracks and crevices where bed bugs live. So you want to follow directions. Regardless of how thorough anybody is, it's highly unlikely that you're going to eliminate a problem in a single visit because of all these challenges and obstacles that we talked about. So follow-up services should occur about every two weeks until the problem is resolved. Now a lot of people say, well, how many follow-ups is it going to take? Well, that all depends. 
Depends on how quickly you reported the problem. If there's just a few bugs or it's a severe infestation. If there's a lot of clutter, if you're removing the clutter, how much cooperation we have is going to all impact how long it's going to take to solve the problem. Remember, you want to avoid secondhand and discarded items, used items. You want to check for bed bugs before bringing anything into your apartment. You want to launder linens frequently, about once a week. You want to reduce clutter, especially around sleeping areas like beds and upholstered furniture. You want to inspect your beds and your sofas often. Interceptors underneath the legs of the beds and the furniture can greatly aid in early detection. If you can afford encasements, these are really a great tool also for not only the protection of your beds, but also the detection of bed bugs. You want to make sure that if you have any suspicion of bed bugs, that you immediately contact property management so they can investigate the situation and get started on it right away if it, in fact it is a bed bug problem. Don't discard of anything on your own. If it's an infested item, call management and have them come up and help you discard it properly. And avoid treating the problem on your own and make sure that you're following the exterminator's recommendations. So I'm going to conclude with this last slide and that basically says that this is a team effort. When you've got large communities and bed bugs coming in from all different directions, if everybody isn't working together, we're not going to be able to get community-wide results. So I use a picture of a three-legged stool because I think people can relate to if, if you have a three-legged stool and one of the legs is not even or equally supported, then the stool is going to fall over. So we have bed bug elimination on the top. We need to have residents who are understanding of the problem, looking for the problem, and are cooperative. We need to have property management who is supportive of the program and going to see it through, and we need to have pest control that can achieve elimination. So this is really a team effort, and we start with educating the community. So with that, there uh, is information. If you have internet access, you can go to the EPA's website. They've got a great um, bunch of information on bed bugs, and I wanted to thank the EPA for funding the educational program. Thank you very much.